Hi, everyone. This is Antonio Rivas, Chairman of EPRAS PropTech Innovation Committee. Happy to welcome you all to this event about AI. Thank you for joining. EPRAS team, uh, Susan, Richard, Nico, Thomas, myself, we are very excited uh, about this webinar. We hope it could be useful for you and your companies, and you will enjoy it and have fun. Uh, I'm passing on now to Susan uh, Hugel, who is the Head of Digital and Technology Continental Europe at CBRE, and member also of EPRAS PropTech Innovation Committee. Susan, we are very happy to count on you to as a moderator on the discussion today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And also welcome from my side to this EPRA webinar that we've organized in cooperation with Yardi. So within the next hour, we will explore why artificial intelligence will be a great game changer and also how it will reshape the real estate industry. As um, maybe every one of you is aware of, AI has been all over the place and in everybody's mind, um, especially last year when the breakthrough of ChatGPT was out there. It reached over 100 million monthly users in just two months, which means that's faster than any other internet application in history. And I don't want to spend much more words on AI because we will do that within the next hour, but I also want to introduce our great people here, our great experts, who will, um, after a keynote, um, join a panel discussion. And we have on the one hand, um, uh, Nico Sumilo, who's Associate Professor at UCL, the University College of London, and also Director of the Bartlett Real Estate Institute. He's also a research visitor at the Bank of England and real estate economist. After his keynote, we will have a panel discussion. And in that panel discussion, we have Thomas Wiegelmann. He's a managing director of Schroeder Real Estate and has been working in the real estate industry since 1999. So very experienced, but he's also working in the academia together with Nico on the topic of AI in real estate and will share with us a broader perspective in the panel discussion. We also have Richard Gerritsen here, who's Senior Director at Yardi Systems and responsible for the growth of Yardi in Europe. He's with Yardi over 18 years now and helped to build the organization to be active in 20, uh, 28 European countries today, which is a broad uh, scope. And um, uh, he's also very passionate about uh, innovation and in general in real estate. And last but not least, we have Antonio Rivas um, joining the panel discussion, sharing his insights. He's CDO and CTO of Merlin Properties and with the company since its foundation. And he's responsible for the full digitalization of Merlin Properties, our new chairman of the EPRA PropTech and Innovation Committee. And we're very much looking forward to all the insights we will um, extract from the panel discussion. But we will start first of all with the keynote. So over to you, Nico. We're very excited to hear. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio, for, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. I will now share my screen and get started with my presentation. If at any point uh, there's a problem and you can't see my screen, if you do have any questions, please send them for, for uh, Real Estate Institute. There's a team of three people looking at AI in real estate, and Suzanne has been uh, kind enough to introduce myself and to introduce Thomas, but she hasn't introduced, and that's because she's not here. She hasn't introduced my wife, who's an AI engineer, a physicist also at UCL, but has kindly been helping us understand what AI is and how it works from the technical perspective. So she's an AI engineer uh, trained in physics. She's a, a lecturer at University uh, College London, but she's also using, looking at AI from the technical side and helping us understand how it works in, in real estate. So I don't have to tell you that AI has been everywhere, all over the news over the last year, maybe 18 months. and. The media is looking at it from different perspectives. So, so uh, there are organizations that are worried about AI and how it's going to impact our industry. There are organizations that are worried about how it's going to change how we work. There are also organizations and the general public is worried about AI taking over the world or maybe uh, bringing down the, the humankind. So you know that's quite a range of perspectives. 
I can tell you I'm not worried about the AI bringing down human race. I think we are some years away from that if uh, that ever becomes uh, a, a danger. But it is something we need to we need to think about. Today, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to what AI is, how it works, and what are the biggest things it can offer to uh, our industry. It's going to be an incredibly high level overview, but I will give you one or two practical examples that I hope you will enjoy. I only have 20 minutes, so for academic, it's you know less than you would take to, to have a tea, but I will do my best to cover as much as I can and, and interest you um, as, as much as I can. So first, what is AI? Essentially, intelligent in this context means able to learn. So it's it's an artificial ability to learn for a machine. So if you think of traditional software, the way it works is the author of the software would write a recipe and would give it to a computer. Everything that happens within that code is written and prescribed by the author of the code. So it's usually a recipe, step by step, what needs to happen when, why, and how. And the author creates all the rules. And the, the programmer or the code writer creates all the rules for the code and gives the uh, machine the, the rules. With an AI algorithm, this is slightly different because what happens is you give AI the goal that, it, that you want it to achieve. And then the AI algorithm follows the rules that it sets itself to achieve that goal. Uh, you know, there's, there's, of course, a big question of how does it set the rules? How does it learn? I will cover that in a minute. But the, AI, the difference between a traditional piece of software and an AI algorithm is that the AI algorithm has a goal and learns the rules of how to achieve that goal itself. So different things, things can happen within the AI algorithm that the programmer didn't anticipate and didn't prescribe. This is not the case in traditional software. Okay, so what do you need in order to get a machine to learn the rules that it's going to follow in order to achieve uh, a goal? You need three things. You need data, you need a model, and you need training. So essentially what you need is you need to start with data. I'm sure I'm not going to surprise anybody when I say AI relies on data quite a lot. So essentially what you do is you have huge amounts of data that you will then feed to a machine to teach it what the rules are that it needs to follow to achieve a, a goal. Now, how does it learn? How does it learn the rules? How does it develop these rules? Well, this is what you do with a model. The programmer will write the algorithm that will allow the machine to learn from the data. The process of learning is prescriptive, as in it is based on mathematical algorithms. Once you write the model, then you need the training. So essentially, you combine the model, the mathematical algorithm, with the data, and then you allow the machine to learn. This is a very lengthy process that requires a lot of computing power. So when you see shares of NVIDIA skyrocket, the reason it does is because of the training element. The training takes a lot of computing power, and to the extent that you would spend billions of, of dollars on just microchips and energy that goes into the training. This is a very uh, intensive process. So you have three elements that then come together into AI. Data, that's hard to get, that's expensive, it's vast. Model, this is what the experts will provide, this is what the very smart researchers will do. And then the training, this is expensive because of the computing power and the energy and the data centers you need in order to do that. Once you combine the three things, you get AI. And you may be thinking at this point, okay, so without all of these three things, I can't do AI. That's not entirely correct. Because now that we have trained AI, like ChatGPT, like Gemini, like Copilot, we can use those models without modeling, without training, and with very little data. And this is the true innovation that came out a couple of years ago, that we can now use these models without the data, without the model, without the training, and with very little knowledge of what AI actually is. It's generative AI that is now taking the world over by storm. Generative AI is AI that can create something genuinely new. It has learned the rules of how to create new things based 
on the massive amount of amount of data it found on the internet. Think of the universe of everything that has ever been on the internet. And based on the rules that it, it's created for itself on answering questions, on creating new content, pictures, videos, it can now create something genuinely new just from learning from the patterns it observed in the data. And the recent breakthroughs make this technology super useful. Now, the technology has been around for a while, maybe, maybe a decade, maybe five years, but recently the ease of communication has improved so much because we can now just speak to a computer and it will understand what we mean. You can just say using your words what you want and the computer will do it. You no longer need to code. You no, no longer need to understand how a machine thinks. It will figure it out. Now it's publicly available. And sure, the paid models are much better than the free models, but they're avail available to the public, not just to academics as, as it was five years ago. And the quality of the generated content is phenomenal. And of course, it takes a little bit of skill to interact with AI well, but once you do it, the quality will blow you away. It can do a lot of logical thinking in a very specific way and in very specific tasks, but it's very, very good at the things that it's supposed to be good at. It can create original content, but also it has access to the internet and it can now browse the internet and learn from that content, which is an incredibly powerful tool to have. I'm now going to give you a super quick overview of the use cases that the team has already seen, seen in the industry. None of this is speculative. All of this is already happening. There are different um, stages of development of the use cases I'm going to go through right now really quickly, but all of this is already happening. So crafting first drafts of texts, you know, this is something that you, every, that you and everybody should already be doing emails, article, investment memorandums, legal documents. If you're not doing this using um, large language models, you're wasting time because the first draft can be really, really good. Most law firms that I have spoken to would generate the first draft using their own internally trained uh, large language models, and then they would give them to somebody who will, who will tailor them to something that is, is um, suitable for a client. Things like summarizing and translation of documents, if you're not doing this, you really should. It's really easy to do, and it will uh, get you a long way towards uh, increasing your efficiency. There are more emerging applications like data analytics and research. From my own perspective, as an economist, I can tell you it's a game changer. It, it, I, I'm never going back to a world in which I'm not using ChatGPT and Gemini and Copilot. It increases my productivity and productivity of my col colleagues by not just increasing the speed, but also increasing the quality of our output. And think of, of other uh, things that we do in, in the real estate industry, like property searches. You know, if you're thinking of trying to match different opportunities to different clients, you can use AI to do this much better and much faster than a human would ever be able to do, uh, just because it can sift through massive amounts of information relatively quickly. It can look at vast amounts of data in real time. So if, if you are sitting in a meeting and you're trying to um, complete a, a piece of work while you're in a meeting, it is now possible um, because things that used to take weeks or days now take hours and minutes. You know, things like using um, virtual re re reality or artificial reality uh, or augmented reality to do site visits, it's helpful. And, and the technology is changing really quickly. It's also changing design and planning. Uh, architects are doing amazing things with generative AI. Planners increasingly are trying to deploy this technology in, in their work. There are challenges. I'm not going to lie. There are serious challenges that they need to address but it is all happening. With smart buildings and ESG, look, you can even use it for compliance. You need to be extremely careful when you use AI for compliance, but you can do it. And if you do, you're going to be faster and your results are going to be better. The same with ESG. There's so much ESG data that nobody understands or, or can reliably use to, to, a, um, to achieve a good goal. AI can help you with this. It can help you set the rules. It can help you understand um, the, the way your buildings are operating and help you optimize it. And this is just the beginning, but enough of me telling you, 
oh, this is possible, that is possible. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you an extremely simple example of something that I hope will be very familiar to you. And I hope it will resonate with sort of the way you can think about AI. What you see on your screen right now is literally copying and pasting pasted from my Valuation 101 class. When I explained to my students for the very first time, the idea that you can value a property, right? So this is the first time they are exposed to the idea that you can put a price on a building. And on the left-hand side, you can see uh, me asking them, okay, well, here's some information about the building. How much do you think it's worth? And everybody in the audience knows that all you need to do is you can calculate the the gross NOI, you can divide it by the cap rate, and that's the rough price uh, of, of, of the building. AI will do that if you just enter this into uh, the prompt, and it will tell you, well, actually, there are two ways of doing this. There's a cost approach, there's an income approach. Sometimes it will al also tell you, well, you need to think about your operating expenses. So maybe you should take off 30% of the rent for operating expenses. But you know what? It's so useful that I'm going to do it live. I'm literally just going to copy this into my chat GPT and show you what happens when you do. So this is literally coming from my valuation 101 class and chat GPT is now telling me, okay, you want to estimate the value of the building. You've provided some details. You tell me that it's uh, in the city of London. There are different ways of, of doing this. This method is based on the ability to generate income. First thing you need to do is you need to calculate the annual gross income. Then you need to deduct the operating expenses. Then you apply the cap rate. So it knows all these things, you know, all these things that we as real estate people uh, take as obvious. But actually, if you're a student, you have no idea that this is how it works. So, okay, it tells me that this is the floor space. This is the rate. This, these are the um, office uh, yields in uh, prime city of London, and then it's crunching the data. And it's giving me the answer to my question, which is just over 1 billion, which is exactly what I had in my presentation. Now, it's a trivial example, but it is an example that I think resonates with everybody. You can make it much more complicated. You can run the whole cash flow analysis within ChatGPT using the rent roll and sort of modeling this for, for different units. I don't know why you would do that, but I'm just giving you an example of things that you can do. You can go one step further because now that we gave it this really, really trivial example, if you wanted sensitivity analysis, all you need to do is ask. Literally, all you need to do is say what I'm saying on the right-hand side and say, okay, give me the sensitivity analysis of the cap rate. And if you want it graphically, all you need to do is you just say, I want it graphically. So, Again, I'm going to copy and paste it into my chat GPT window. I'm going to ask for a sensitivity analysis of the cap rate. And sure, of course we could do this in Excel, but all of us know that the process of learning how to do these things in Excel was not actually an enjoyable thing to do. We are stuck with it, but the students I'm teaching now, they actually prefer to do these things in chat GPT rather than Excel. And I don't think Excel is going away anytime soon, but I do think it is very, very useful. And there we go. This is our sensitivity analysis. ChatGPT knows what the sensitivity analysis is, knows how to run it, knows how to visualize it, and knows exactly what to tell me, you know, cap rates ranging from 2% to 8%. This is the sensitivity analysis. I am running out of time, so I'm going to stop showing you interesting things, and I'm just going to tell you what else it can do. Because the next thing you can do if you want the Monte Carlo analysis, which again, you could do in Excel, but here, all you need to do is just say, give me a Monte Carlo analysis. Like this, you have it within seconds. Literally, while you're in a meeting, you can do the, the Monte Carlo analysis, the sensitivity analysis, while you carry on with the conversation. This is now possible, and this is a relatively technical example, but I'm just showing you what it can do. You want a sense, uh, scenario analysis, you can now discuss scenarios with AI based on market reports, based on your own priors, based on your own experience. You can have a conversation about what different scenarios mean for your cash flow analysis. You're thinking, you're worried about interest rates being higher for longer, about the, the office market not being what it used to be. 
you can now have a conversation with ChatGPT and it will give you a really well-informed debate and discussion on what these things really, really mean for you. Okay, I'm now gonna run really quickly through the research that I think I find convincing and useful on how AI is, is uh, changing our world. Uh, my favorite study from Boston Consulting Group, what they did is they divide, they took 400 BCG consultants, divided them into three groups, uh, control group, group that got access to chat GPT and group that got access to chat GPT and some training. Turns out that people who got access to, GP, to chat GPT finished more tasks. So they were able to complete tasks that people without chat GPT, GPT were not able to complete. Did them 25% more quickly, a massive increase in speed and produced output that was 40% better. This is absolutely massive. There was a caveat because this only applies to tasks that AI is supposed to be good at. If you try to use it for stuff it's not supposed to be good at, you get very little benefit. There is a study after study after study uh, that shows really large benefits. These are just the ones that I read and I think are trustworthy. For example, there's one from the Bank of England and the London School of Economics that says that when you give chat GPT or another similar model to forecasters, the forecasting accuracy increases by 23% just because they can now discuss their assumptions with somebody who's critically evaluating them and they have a sounding board that is relatively objective and very knowledgeable. There are productivity benefits among college workers and especially in, in writing tasks. The, you can use ChatGPT to replicate survey responses when you do market research. If you want to know uh, whether it can help you with customer uh, support, Research shows that it, in, it can increase the efficiency of customer support, not just by interacting with customers directly, but also by helping your customer support workers be better, have better access to information and respond better. And especially this applies to novice workers, people who don't have all the experience and who need to ask questions. Really quickly, I'm now going to run through how uh, at the Institute, we think AI is going to change the work. It's going to change it in four ways. So how work is being done, what work is being done, who does the work and who captures value. How work is being done is going to change because now every skilled professional is going to benefit, benefit from AI. We're going to change the type of work that we do because we're going to focus more on decision making and less on technical things that AI can do. People who do the work are going to change. There's going to be more work for senior people, more work for junior people. There's going to be less work for mid-level uh, workers who will need to retrain. And a lot of people who know how to use AI to create value are going to capture this value because that's how uh, these transitions ha have happened in the past. So AI experts are going to, to capture a lot of value data owners, but also senior decision makers are going to benefit hugely from AI as long as they can adapt. So just before I finish off, I just wanted to share this website, which is something that we created at the Institute just for the purpose of sort of spreading the message of, of AI. We created, I think it's now around 30 use cases that I think everybody in real estate should know. This is something that you can have a look at. There are instructions, pictures, and descriptions of, of how to go through the use cases on the, on the website. I think, I think it's transformative. There is also some training if you're interested. We think uh, it's really useful. The feedback we've been getting is phenomenal. So I encourage you to, to have a look. But I'm also happy to uh, answer any questions. I think the key message that I want to, to share with you today is everybody should be looking into this because it, it affects everybody's work. It can not only make your company, your team better, it can make your own work better. It will make you better, faster. It will not make you work less because you will just end up using the same time for, for doing more of your work. So I'm not saying it will save you a ton of time uh, in general, but it will make you more efficient and it will, you allow, and it will allow you to do things that you haven't been able to do in the past, but would love to do and you should be doing. So on that note, I would like to finish. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nico, for that very insightful presentation, um, spanning a lot of topics around um, AI and also providing yeah a, a very good starting point for our panel discussion. 
So um, you have just shown the wide range of productivity that um, artificial intelligence can bring. Depending on the topic, you also mentioned, so there was uh, at a maximum of 40%. Let's look into that when starting that panel discussion. Also, dear audience, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A tool, drop some questions in. We will pick them up at the end um, of the discussion and uh, feel free to interact with us as well. So the productivity and the benefits, let's start off with that one. Um, maybe Antonio, because you have um, a very good footprint in uh, real estate, being kind of a user and um, applying artificial intelligence as well. Where do you see the biggest benefits for artificial intelligence uh, in real estate very specifically? Well, we, we see, first of all, thank you, Nico, for a great presentation. Uh, I think it was very clear and, and very uh, directly to, to the points in a very initial level that I think is very useful for people maybe just to get inside this uh, artificial intelligence world that I think is uh, is changing and, and already the the, the way we, we're doing things that we're going to do. And just, just you, you were talking about two things. The first was uh, about uh, data and about rules. That's basically how these models work. I want just to talk about uh, and show two examples about that just uh, coming now recently about, for example, Sora, uh, that just for those people who don't know, is the artificial intelligence to create a video uh, for their open I launched it like three, four weeks ago. And you can just see that, you can see that this is impressive. Uh, you can just think about uh, this is uh, something that is going to affect totally to one in industry that is the audiovisual industry. But then when you start reading the papers, when you go up in lawyer, you say that what they have created and based on what Nico said, rules, what they, they have done is what they call world simulator or uh, a, a, a universe simulator. That what it is do is uh, they're trying to recreate what is the world right now with the same structures, with the same rules, with the same, they try to know, to understand, they have been trained to predict understanding what are these rules in the world. For example, they know that if I'm going to create a video and I'm going to predict that I have a cap and it's going to go to the floor, if the cap is made by glass, it's going to be broken. If it's made by paper, it's not going to be broken. They go to levels that they saw that if I throw in a stone, depending on the angle of my hand, depending on the strength that I'm putting, depending on the height and the velocity acceleration, etc., how that's going to look. They know about the fluid mechanics. They know about how the world uh, works. And you can just think, wow, that's amazing. Or you can just go one step forward and you can just think like, well, if that can really predict the way the world's world now, we're going to arrive to a point where uh, the data that now is limited and it has a copyright is not going to be a problem anymore because I'm going to be able to predict and to create synthetic data. And once I have the synthetic data, what I'm going to be able is to train the models on a way that they're going to be uh, to another level. And that's going to make this very exponential. Uh, and that's what I think that this is just totally the beginning about what this, uh, where we are now. And we've seen that that's application on robotics. And we see that application with this uh, figure out, uh, the, the company figure launched last week, uh, this bot, this robot uh, with uh, chat GPT as a brain that's doing things that they couldn't do before in October, for example. And, and we have seen these uh, large language models that we're talking about, large multimodal models that we're talking about that they can do just see, understand to you, create pictures, uh, coding, et cetera. We are still seeing the first la large action models that they are like models that they, you tell them an action and they do everything by yourself. We already have seen the launch of Rabbit and for sure we're gonna see that soon in the phones too. So we are seeing all these things and where this is going, uh, you want to must be thinking, okay, that's great, Antonio, what has to be with real estate? Well, when you see this trend, I just go back and just trying to see uh, many years ago, uh, it was normal to go to the store, it was normal to go to the mall to shop there. In the company, we uh, thought that, well, maybe this trend can be changed. And we just made a bet and we just made a plan about logistics many years ago. And now it's obvious that it's a logistic chain there's like a supply chain and, and everything is normal and, and the world has moved there is not also need if you want something in your home you can receive it and the way we see about this infrastructure is going to be need for everything i was explaining and what this world we just thought uh that we have made the analysis and to just know that the all this infrastructure is going to have to be somewhere and that place is going to be data centers 
And that's why we, we are leading an ambition investment plan to be a relevant player uh, in the European market about data centers. And we have already created three data centers in the company and in Portugal and in Spain that they have like a super privileged location since all the cable are coming from the North of America, South America, Asia, they're coming there and we have very, very good level of latency. But uh, well, that's a way on how can go that way. So in Kenya Tech on that, how the infrastructure is gonna be there. It can be there about productivity, as you were saying, that is gonna affect all the digital digitalization of the process that we already have done put in the company too. And can affect different points of view, but I just want to just bring this perspective that I think is interesting about for, for the panel and for the conversation. Definitely. And also, I mean, uh, rephrasing it in a nutshell, what you're saying is that what we see now is just a, a, a tiny bit of the surface of what artificial intelligence can do. And there's much more to be expected while you're also um, very much engaged you as a, as a, as a person and uh, also your company um, by, by focusing on data centers. Maybe also the question to you, Thomas, because you are from a bird's perspective overseeing both the acad academic side, but also the real estate industry. Where do you uh, see the biggest benefits for artificial intelligence, very clear use cases? Yeah, I think um, I would, you know, answer a little bit broad. I think, um... You know, with the institute um, at UCL, we have the benefit to to speak to a lot of um, you know leading real estate um, organizations as well as professionals. And I think what we can clearly say is, um, you know, the industry is already experiencing the the influence of AI. And and you know, a, as you mentioned in your in your opening statement, it has you know everybody has become really involved since JetGPT, um, you know, launched the offering. But since mid of last year, we really feel that people engage. And, and also that we see, you know, that people in the industry who deal with AI and who try to, you know, find out how it might relate to their business, they see the transformative potential. So significance, performance enhancements, and, you know, in terms of quality, as, as Nico pointed out, referring to studies, productivity. Uh, associated with the use of AI. And so your question uh, and, and, and the answer to that, I think sooner than later, um, it will affect all major value chain elements in the industry. Um, so I think that's, that, so you can't say like, where is the biggest benefit? I think Nico referred to some use cases and, and maybe we can broaden that up a little bit uh, in the later discussion. But but I think, you know, it, it will be really relevant in, in the whole profession. And um, what we also see then, you know, speaking to um, to those organizations and individuals is that you have still a lack of understanding and expertise. I think that's a relevant aspect, you know, applied expertise and how generative AI works that obviously can hinder implementation. And then also um, what we see is that, that there are no, you know, approaches to best practice or, you know, use cases. Uh, Nico referred to them listed on the website. Um, but but to really come up, you know, to a to a decision and an analysis, you know, where in, in which use cases, in which tasks can AI be really, um, you know, support the business. And then what we also see is the, the capabilities in AI, they continue to expand significantly and, and really fast. So when we um, look into our program and, you know, we, we really have to constantly update it because there are so many new um, features. Um, and Antonio just referred, you know, to, uh, to, to, to a really new and, and recent development. So we see a lot of change there. And I think it's, it's one of the challenges for professionals to recalibrate the understanding and organizations, they really have to recognize the potential and risks. And that's obviously a challenge, you know, when you think about combining um, humans and, and AI, uh, you know, in a way that, that you optimize. But, but again, the short answer is I, I expect that sooner than later, it will really affect most of the value chain elements and we can dig into the use cases um, um, uh, later uh, if desired but i think one key message is also you know expertise needs to be done uh, and and to be built you know that's obviously education but it's also um, you know employee driven upskilling so you have to have people in your teams maybe in the various you know um, areas of the business who constantly you know, experiment um, with AI and, and Gen AI tools. And that's what we do also reflecting now on, on what Schroders is doing. Um, th that's what we are doing. So we have our own um, a version of AI 
um, and, and that's called Genie. And uh, we monitor that. So roughly 25 to, to 30 percent of our professionals use it constantly. Um, and there are specific benefits in areas where it's used. Um, but I think that's a very important aspect um, of that discussion. Just really get out, get familiar and, and learn. Okay, very good. So let's um, uh, dive a little bit deeper into the topic and also apply the tech perspective. Richard, um, what are the low-hanging fruits? Um, what can we already do today with AI? So we heard there will be a huge wave rolling towards us, a lot of um, upside potential, but what can we already do today? Yeah, I think uh, it is good that you mentioned, uh, thank you, Susanna, the, the low-hanging fruit on this. But And as Nico had in his presentation, you know, AI is nothing more than a tool, a very important and powerful tool, but it's it's the tool. So uh, uh, I noticed in a lot of discussions uh, last week at MIPIM, but also uh, in other discussions that we have that we, you know, we focus on the hammer, but not, you know, with the piece of furniture that was built with it. So when we uh, are uh, talking about examples about low-hanging fruit uh, technology that is available today, um, we at Yardi uh, at the moment for 2024, we focus on two different uh, uh, types of deployment when it comes to uh, when it comes to AI. One is uh, streamlining operations. Eh? How can we uh, help our clients work more efficiently? Um, there are a couple of elements to that. Uh, uh, you know, there are areas where um, no one or, or uh, 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 things that are already in use, like uh, abstraction of uh, uh, leases, data abstraction of leases, of loan uh, documents, uh, you know, uh, purchase invoices, etc. Um, the uh, the hit rate or the 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 quality uh, of data. Uh, is much more improved by having this level of intelligence uh, over it. A very simple example, uh, there's a vendor, Richard Gerritsen, who sends you an invoice for a thousand euros every month, but the invoice in uh, March was 5,000 euros. And that will be uh, in order to keep the process as much as possible straight, uh, uh, straight through processing, you only have to, or the AI will flag this uh, this exception, uh, where then the, the operator, the human, uh, can then focus on it. What is uh, what is going on? Um, so there's a whole range of uh, yeah deployment of AI uh, that of uh, that is focused on on streamlining operations. Uh, the second big uh, theme is is all around uh, chat and and creating of uh, of content really. Um, uh, one application that we have very successfully rolled out in the US is a chatbot that helps our clients communicate with uh, tenants and potential tenants. Uh, potential tenants has question. Uh, let's take a, a residential unit as an example. Uh, does it have a, a balcony? Is the balcony on the south, etc., uh, uh, etc.? Et what is the rent? Is there a pet policy, etc.? So. We know chatbots as there is a question and there might be an answer. With the introduction or maybe the the, the enhancement in AI, it is uh, possible to um, answer in the same tone and in the same language as uh, the the person who asked the question uh, has. So you know, I have a complaint. There's something wrong with my unit. I have an agitated uh, tone. Um, the the chatbot knows to you know in the choice of words, uh, with it, it will be uh, uh, more of a, a calm a calming uh, formulating of uh, of the response. Also, you know when a sixty year old man has a question, uh, uses a different tone and a different language than uh, a twenty one year old uh, woman would do. Uh, the bot is intelligent enough to answer in the same language, as in not English versus Spanish or whatever, but in the same language and the same wording that is being used. That same functionality or that same logic, that same intelligence is uh, now being applied, you know, within the Yardi platform itself. So uh, what we are working on and introducing later this year is that 
instead of running a report in Yardi, um, the user can actually formulate, as in ChatGPT, uh, uh, a question, uh, and and the system then will respond in a similar way as ChatGPT would respond. The difference is that ChatGPT uses a data set that is more public and probably a lot bigger. And the functionality that our users will use then, or our clients will use, that is focused on their Yardi data in the database, and will be very specific then to the questions that they have. Those are the uh, the examples that we uh, already have introduced to the market or that we will be introducing in the next couple of months, uh, which I would consider low-hanging fruit. Very interesting. And um, what it all has in common, we've already heard about the topic of education to upskill the people to use it properly, right? Because in, in the end, it's also a change, that kind of new opportunity, which a lot of people will also welcome to answer or communicate in natural language. Um, also, question also, to you, Nico. Well, okay, that's a Sorry, Susan, before changing the topic, uh, what, what uh, Richard was saying about the chatbots is very interesting. Also, the time of reducing about an answer that the chatbot is giving to you that is kind of uh, identifying if it's a chatbot for the time when it lasts less than a half second, is uh, you can kind of relation that is, is a normal answer to somebody. And, and there are already examples of, of very reduced uh, time, time in reducing in the answer of the chatbots that, that made that everything that Richard was explaining super well about how they, they identify plus that uh, speed on answering that makes totally. Yeah, I agree, Antonio. And it is, you know, when we talk about the value of AI and the value of how, in this case, this was deployed, um, our clients see an uptick in conversion rates. The uptick, uh, uptick is between 20 and 30 percent of conversion from prospective tenants to tenants. So it has, you know, take out all the cost reduction, working more efficiently, but it, uh, it, it, it is also a tool that helps you uh, operate more effectively. Uh, and not only because it is outside office hours, but you get a better result. Mm -hmm. Also, people may must be thinking that a chatbot is that you write something or you talk to them, they answer. But very soon we're gonna start seeing that on the screens too. You're gonna go to website, you're gonna ask, and you're gonna see like a bot physically there. They just move in the face. Their reaction, their reaction is kind of similar to you, and that's something already I've seen some examples of of that. Uh, and, and probably could be more common in the, in the future, not just to see as a chatbot, that's something that you write or something that is there, but as a kind of say person that you can see and interact and they react to the way that you ask the questions or, or how upset or happy you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially in property management, I guess it will be at a 24 seven um, availability um, and accessibility is also a big plus which um, uh, is uh, uh, yeah, a great benefit for, for both sides. But over to Nico, and this is basically a question coming from the audience, very interesting because we know that the real estate industry has a lot of um, uh, yeah, companies with a small workforce, but highly skilled real estate professionals. So that's very typical. Um, so what's the clear business case for generative AI? How to upskill the people and also, um, yeah, how to how to bring dedicated software in place? Thank you. That, that's a really great question. And I, I think, look, the first thing everybody should do, regardless of the, the size of the company, you should start using it. It will change how you work. It will make you faster. It will make you better, more efficient. You know, you've heard me say this before. Essentially, there are three things uh, that you can, you can get out of it. First is you will be able to do the same things you're doing at the moment, just faster and better. That's good. Second, you will be able to do things that in the past you knew were possible, but you didn't know how to do this because AI knows how to do this. It can either do this for you or explain to you how you should do it. And then there's the third category where AI will tell you, hey, there are things you didn't even know you can do or should do, but these things might be interesting. Maybe you should look into them. So this is how it helps everybody. Now, regardless of the size of the team, Look, if the, the uh, Boston Consulting Group study shows that even highly skilled professionals will benefit, they will be better, faster, more innovative, and so on. If you give it to very highly trained PhD forecasters at the Bank of England, they will be more effective. And so, so that's the low hanging fruit. Tr train your people how to do this, train them to, before they do anything, 
make them think, hmm, could AI do this for me? Could AI help me with this? The answer might be yes. And in this case, they should be using this. And this is where you should start. Very low cost, very high return. ROI on this is phenomenal. And then take it from there. Maybe there are further tools that are suitable to you. Maybe there are um, uh, uh, solutions out there that can make a huge difference, like uh, what Richard was saying, to your specific uh, type of business. But I'm answering this question without knowing anything about your business, because everybody should be doing this. All, all I know is that it's a small team, right? <laughs> and yet I can tell you, you definitely should be looking into this. And then uh, depending on what you're doing and how um, your business runs, then maybe you should be engaging with this uh, the tools that Richard is offering you because they do have something that is really, really useful and maybe something else from, from um, um, you know, another uh, company. You know, there's a list of tools. I would, if especially if you have a small team, I would probably not start developing internal solutions. That's expensive, difficult, and very likely to be obsolete really quickly the way the technology is changing so working with an external provider at the moment is probably a, a safer bet i i hope that answers the question real very estate good. happens to be a, a very data heavy industry right so it's you know a, a lot of the elements are there sorry susan yeah and i mean um uh, it's it's also um uh, framing very well that real estate companies are very likely to stay real estate companies, but the differentiation will be to what extent they will apply technology to be better, faster, and so on. Maybe also a question on, on, on the tech side towards you, Richard. What does it mean? Will, will the big tech companies, so the big techs, will they grow or will it be more the prop tech sector, very specific but smaller startup companies in the tech sector? Um, will they grow? So do you see a shift over there? We do not know yet. So where where is the topic of prop tech coming in? Will it be the specific use cases or will it be more the generic big tech companies having influence on our industry? Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, big tech will definitely in, increase the role. And that is because, you know, like I said, you know, real estate is a very data heavy industry. So anything around uh, market data, you know, uh, data about area, ge uh, demographics and all of that, that will play a big role. And that is where I think is an area where where big tech, where the, the, the use of big tech technology uh, will increase. Having said that, there is a whole set of data where big you know that is not publicly available you know lease data uh, 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 is is a good example of that you know that is something very specific that is not public information that is somewhere in a database um, uh, uh, of a real estate company so that is where i think that uh, the uh, you know the opportunity is for uh, uh, for tech companies that are focused on uh, on real estate where uh, uh, where maybe the same you know chat GPT technology or AI of or whatever you want to call it is being used is being deployed but then very specific uh, uh, to a certain uh, part or a, a certain focus of uh, where where real estate uh, professionals are working in. Mm -hmm. And um, this also goes to the next question into the direction. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. So we were talking about data and information in that industry. What will it mean in the future for decision making, especially investment decisions to buy a property, right? Um, maybe Thomas, um, mm. do you have um, a view on that? Will will investment companies become obsolete? So, or, or what part of the investment companies will become obsolete with AI? I don't think that that investment companies will become obsolete. Um, but uh, again, the combination of, uh, you know, the human profession, let's put it like this, and using the power of AI will be, will be, I think, a key success factor going forward. And I think, you know, looking into the investment side of things, I, I, I think capital allocators um, who, will, who will really, um, you know, actively review their, their process and, and the relevant aspects to be checked in manager due diligence. So in the context of manager selection, I think it will be important for investment managers to demonstrate um, how they use AI 
and how that that um, will optimize kind of the outcome for the clients, so the the, the investors. I think that's more kind of a uh, an answer. How will it affect investment firms? I think when it then comes to to the investment decisions, uh, I think you know the the data processing capabilities with AI, will, I think will significantly enhance market research and and specifically the predictive analytics. Um, you know, utilizing historic data, um, you know, will make it easier um, to forecast market trends. There, there will be you know many more data points, and at the end of the day, you know, that will allow the real estate professionals to make more informed decision and to adjust strategies proactively and and you know at the end of the day also um reducing the risks for for investors so i think that's 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 uh, the second part of the the answer and um i think one of the key challenges again uh, for for the industry is how to use uh, and leverage that massive data um which is there and i think um you know richard has has provided some examples of that but overall, I, I expect that you know investment managers um, will need to be able to demonstrate how they how they use AI and how that is for the benefit of all the stakeholders. So basically, you're saying the the human will not become obsolete. Um, there will yeah. be enough work, um, especially on the data side and on the AI side, so on the tech side, to properly apply um, all the information and gather the data that is needed for it. Um, uh, also, um, looking a little or zooming a little bit out, because we were talking a lot about use cases and the technology and the tech companies around it, um, looking more on the real estate. And this might be a quite interesting question for you, Antonio, because uh, the impact on real estate, you already mentioned that um, you have a focus on data centers. Um, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on, on your assumptions uh, and also what else might change for real estate um, and also regarding the properties in the near future. Well, yeah, I mean, I was talking about the, the data centers because uh, after Analyze identify uh, this all infrastructure that was going to be needed is something that obvious uh, is going to have to be somewhere unless probably in a super long future we have found the solution to just be floating in the space but now it has to be in there and it has to be somewhere and and it's something that maybe uh we used to have that on uh buildings which company has to have that on the buildings or whatever but when you start these start growing all this technology you just kind of start to uh need a specific areas to just have that with certain conditions with uh equipments that they are quite uh heavy that uh just a rack of three uh meter size like 100 uh sorry 1500 uh kilos so it's it's, it's something that uh, re, re, uh requires uh something but then just uh thinking about your question about other different things that can be applied actually can be applied to to many things and, and it can affect uh, on a way on the on the chain to different things. Uh, since have better information about what's going on, to be more productive uh, internally, to just be able to do analysis of what's going on in the market based on uh, information that you have for data quite organized. And I think that's more about how you have the company now, how tight, let's say, is your company now, and how you're going to be able to be able to use all these tools than just thinking that uh, just putting the tools itself, they're gonna do all the work. So it's gonna be very productive, it's gonna help a lot, it's going to just change totally the paradigm. Uh, talking about society is gonna change uh, works and, and and I see that and and the, the, the more I see things happening, uh, the more I believe in that because uh, for example, just uh, if you see the first version of ChatGPT that it was uh, November 2022, it's been a year and a half and now, you see now what ChatGPT does or what Glob3 that just launched that was part of our training with this synthetic data that I was talking about. You just, with the window contest, uh, there is just the kind of parameters they can just give it to you and when you are talking. You, we're just talking about that with Gemini, they're talking about 1 million parameters when we were talking just about 35,000 uh, some months ago. So it means that you're gonna be able to put like a video of 10 hours and they're gonna be able to know in which frame uh, there is a guy that have a paper on the pocket and that applies to everything that's give you that this go very fast uh the, the the models every time they can predict better on a way that is totally understanding what's going on and and i think that's something that's going to affect different uh points of view of 
gesprochen. Okay, and since we are almost approaching the end of the hour, we have a fantastic last question from uh, one of our people in the audience, which I would like to do a quick round with all of you. So the question is um, how to start uh, with an AI strategy for a commercial real estate company? What would be your three main priorities? And maybe Richard, let's let's start with you. Um, what is your recommendation, your three main priorities you would recommend a commercial real estate company to start drafting an AI strategy? Yeah, I would almost say the first three things are data, data, and data. It is, uh, we see a lot of uh, um, operating models, a lot of strategies out there where an investment firm decides, well, you know, I don't want the detailed data. Um, I don't need it to do my work. Um, and, you know, th there is no benefit for me or the cost benefit or the risk is way too much. Um, there are there are very big successful organizations also outside real estate like i don't know amazon and 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 google that would kill for the quality of the data uh, and uh, and the volume of the data that any property is producing so my uh, yeah my first response is have a real focus on ownership of data the quality of the data and use that as a starting point to formulate what do you want to know uh, of your property, of the performance of your property, uh, the risks uh, at, at uh, tenant level and the risk at property level? And it, once you have done that, and that is in some cases uh, quite a lot of work when you have all your data outsourced to a lot of uh, different service providers in different countries uh, with different data definitions, etc. So... Quite frankly, although I'm really, really excited about AI, you need to do the boring, uh, the boring work first, and that is getting control of the data and uh, uh, and having ownership. Fantastic! A brief answer from you, Thomas. Your yeah. three main priorities. <laughs> I think uh, first answer is make AI a priority. So I think you know any real estate company you know who, who the, the 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 management um you know advisory boards um formal function they should really make sure that that you know there is expertise embedded in you know in the in the overseeing or on the management level and make it a priority i think that would be really uh, the first answer and then i think it's really about acquiring and retaining skilled professionals who are really interested in ai um, and, you know, that can be younger team members and, you know, just promote them, keep them active, motivate them. And the third is education. Um, I think we are really at a, you know, early stage um, and, and education is key. Just learn, be, be open and be interested in, in what's happening. Um, that would be my three topics. <laughs> Very good. Antonio, three short <laughs> well, you, you live into the way also I started to do less options because I was going to say that you have to tell the company, as I said before, but Richard explained super well that you need to have the data totally specified, totally clear to really know what you want. Also about education and not just education, first education, as uh, Nico was uh, showing, like what is it about, how to use it easy, then uh, you have to be super updated on, on, on the news because what you learned six months ago is all today. And and that those goes really fast, and you you just have to to have that, and 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 then uh, well, the third just that everybody believes that this is a truth. It's not something that uh, can be maybe we'll see what's happening as another maybe boom or sort of trends that we've seen in in the past. I we do believe in this one. That's why I was saying at the beginning of this of this uh, data center plan because we really think that this is a reality. We we not within it now. We have start thinking some years ago, just trying to anticipate the trend. That's something that is here, and that's something that uh, is going to affect everyone. And 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 I think the society has to be conscious about it. And and the best way is education, and try to just apply that inside. Very good, thank you. And um, the last three main priorities to you, Nico. What is your recommendation? Uh, I'm an academic, so of course I'm going to say training. Um, that that's easy. The second one would be experimentation. You should experiment with whatever works for you. Um, you, you should play with this. You should try uh, different solutions. Most of them are low hanging fruit um, and, and they won't uh, cost you a lot. 
And the third one is creativity and alignment with your um, goals. It's not something that you should make or, or, or try to build a competitive strategy around unless you have great capabilities within AI. It's something that should help you strengthen your own competitive advantage. So, you know, learn how to do this because everybody should experiment with it, see what works for you and try to incorporate uh, AI into your business model the, the best way you can and scale it up. Eventually, of course, you should scale it up, but you shouldn't start with that. Very good. So I think we so made the best um, from, um, out of these 60 minutes. Um, a lot of great takeaways at the end of the session, a great input at the very beginning with your keynote. So thank you very much, dear um, experts here um, at the panel discussion. And also thank you out there, dear audience. It was very interactive with you in the chat and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, wish you a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.